round of applause, please, for Mr. Marcus Allen. Thank you, and good evening. And Andy, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I hope I'll be able to live up to it. And if in an hour, A, you're still here, B, you're still awake, and C, you're still waiting to ask those questions, I'll know we've succeeded. You may know me as the editor, or not the editor, the publisher of Nexus magazine. And those of you who are familiar with it, you'll know that uh, it's worth the read. Those of you who are not familiar with it, you can buy your latest copy on the table outside. Available at a discounted price for cash this evening. Now, the Apollo moon landings. That's what we're going to talk about. Just before we do, I just want to let you know a little bit about who I am and why I am challenging the official version. About 40 years ago, I watched the moon landings. I'm that old. 9.30, no, 3.30 in the morning it was. I sleep on the sofa, woke up in time and watched the blurry images of somebody doing something. And it was very exciting and I thought, wow, this is great, this is exactly what we want. What a great achievement. And for 25 years, like many people, I believed that this is what was happening, that it, what was shown was for real. And ironically, at uh, one of those famous meetings in Glastonbury, an American speaker, David Childress, got up and he was doing a talk about various other things. And one of the things he mentioned was the moon landings. And he said, in a very matter-of-fact way, he said, of course, you know, they never happened. Not the way we've been shown. And I thought, what's he on about? And I thought, well, I was trained as a photographer back in the 60s. I worked in London as a photographer. I've used the cameras that they were supposedly used on the Apollo missions, the Hasselblad cameras. And I thought, I should be able to spot if there's a problem here. So I had a look at the pictures. You couldn't download them off the internet then. There wasn't such a thing as an internet. So I had to find various prints of the pictures and I looked at them and I thought, mm -hmm. yeah, I see there's a bit of a problem here. Because I know how difficult the cameras are to use, having used them myself. And I could see the high quality of the images that we were watching, or we were looking at then. And I thought, yeah, there's something weird here. And the more I looked at it, the more I discovered that there were anomalies. There were things that didn't add up. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So let's just start with the basic subject. But the second part, is it fact or is it fiction? Most people will say, of course it's fact. I saw it happen, I've seen the pictures, I've heard the interviews, I've read the books, I've watched the TV. I've... It's for real. How can, you, how can you possibly fake something like that? And then you get this. And this is the, the ultimate arbiter, isn't it, of truth. National Geographic, 1968, this cover came out. The world's top-selling magazine at the time, 11 million copies. If anybody knew if there was a problem with the photographs, you would expect National Geographic to have spotted it. But they didn't. They published pages of photographs. Let's go back a little bit, because you do need to get the backstory to the moon landings. And this is more or less where it, where it started. Yuri Gagarin, in 1961, Life magazine cover dated April the 21st, 1961. This was America's wake-up call. America was suddenly aware that they couldn't do what the Russians had done. They couldn't put a man in space. And we all thought, brave man, wonderful. He's done such a good job. But let's just have a look at what the Russians actually achieved, because that's a key part of this. Because six weeks after that cover, in May... May the 25th, 1961, President John Kennedy got up in the House of Congress and made his famous speech to land a man on the moon before the decade is out. That was the challenge. At that point, May 1961, no American had been into space. Alan Shepard had gone up on the top of a rocket and come down again. Hardly getting into space. He'd gone no higher than the X-15 planes, the rocket planes that had been flying uh, quite a few years earlier than that. And no American had been into space. They didn't know they could do it. They didn't know what they could do. They didn't know how they could uh, achieve this. But Kennedy, as president, made the challenge, and America has to come along and fulfill it. Now, what's happening over in Russia? 
In the context of its time, we've got the Cuban Missile Crisis, we've got the space race hotting up, a little bit later we have Kennedy being assassinated, we have the student riots at Kent University, we have the Vietnam War getting particularly nasty, we have Robert Kennedy being assassinated, we have Martin Luther King being assassinated, we have Malcolm X being assassinated, we have upheaval in America. It's not a pretty sight. It's a decade of change. A decade many people grew up in. You're probably familiar with much of this that was going on. Yet in Russia, we didn't hear very much about it. But Russia has a remarkable ability to keep quiet about its failures and just tell us what we want to hear. They can make their cosmonauts disappear. The top of those two pictures, each of those pictures, shows a cosmonaut. The bottom one shows him missing in the center and slightly to the right of the bottom one. They're just airbrushed out. And the reason they were airbrushed out is because they no longer were alive. The man in the middle, on the top left, is Sergei Korolev, the originator and the driving force behind the Russian space program. He was a genius. On his right is Yuri Gagarin, the man we've all come to think of as the first man in space. And no, he wasn't. He wasn't the first man in space. He wasn't even the second or the third. He was the tenth Russian into space. And we know that because two Italian brothers, Giudica Cord... I can't, my Italian's not brilliant. They were two Italian brothers. <laughs> Giudica Cordelia was their name. And they were listening in to the Russian radio transmissions from their orbiting spacecraft. They rigged up some remarkable uh, transmitters. Excuse me, I'll just get my pointer so we can see it. These were the uh, rigs that they were listening in to the Russian space program. And obviously they were in Russian. So these two guys, they're, they're quite serious about it. They're still alive today. Their sister learned Russian so she could translate what was going on. And what they were hearing, Valentin Bondarenko was one of them. He survived his flight, but he had 100% burns. He was taken to hospital. His flight was in late March, early April 1961. The ninth Russian into space was this gentleman, Vladimir Ilushin. The name is familiar, Ilushin. He was the son of the aircraft designer, the Russian aircraft designer. He was Russia's top test pilot. He held many airspeed records. He was basically a, a hero of the Soviet Union, and quite rightly, he'd achieved a great deal. On April the 5th, 1961, he was launched in a capsule very similar to that of Gagarin. And after three orbits, he landed. Unfortunately, he landed in the wrong country. He landed in China. He overshot. He was very badly injured. He was taken to hospital. He spent many months recovering. And the, way, the reason that we know that this happened was because the Chinese, following Gagarin's flight a week later, refused to attend any of the diplomatic receptions held around the world to celebrate Gagarin's flight.